So for those of you who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures Conference first occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s. And to quote its co-founder, it arose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Now, whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as the Guardian put it, its actual aim, hidden behind the brush still, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic prophets, and the techno parties, was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did, or at least tried to do, was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. This Salon series completes the conference's aim to bury the 21st century and begin work, sorry, 20th century, and begin work, <laughs> was too soon, and begin work on the 21st. So, in that theme, let's begin. I am blessed to be able to welcome John Higgs to the Virtual Futures stage this evening. Now, it was a Jungian synchronicity that led me to John's work. Always is. It always is. It was somewhere between the nexus of reading Robert Anton Wilson, Timothy Leary about the KLF and about Alan Moore that I became aware of John's writing. And as magic, uh, as it is with magic, it came as no surprise for me to find that his latest book was about that subject we know a little bit about here at Virtual Futures, The Future. His new work, The Future Starts Here, reveals the importance of storytelling in how we construct our future narratives, starting with a premise that things might not be as apocalyptic as we expect. And so reading this book, I, I personally was on, on the belief that surviving the future largely depended on our ability to tell stories about human progress. In other words, if we are going to survive the future, then we have to be on a continuous growth trajectory. And to do that, it holds that we will need to tell bedtime stories about how to achieve that growth. And then how do we do that? Well, we return to Adam Smith economics, and we return to the limitations of growth. And we look at those, and we try and work out how the future plays when we have this thing around limitations. And we look at those three things that Adam Smith looked at, land, labor, and capital and try and decide how we're going to overcome those limits. Well, we're trying to tell ourselves the bedtime stories to stop ourselves from going completely apocalyptic, and the first one starts with the first thing Adam Smith talked about, which was land. How do we get more land? We've, we've geographically traveled the continents and we've, we've taken over as much land as we possibly can, and there's no more land to extend into, then where do we go? Well, we go off-world. We discover new land, land out there. We colonize the stars, almost like human hubris. We believe that we're going to populate the stars. And, and if that doesn't work, if it turns out that in actual fact, space might be really, really fucking hard, the next thing we could potentially do is cyberspace. We won't have to go out there, we just have to go in here. And we can live in one meter square boxes and put on VR headsets and live in, in exponentially growing environments that are born and live in digital space. So potentially that's the land problem solved. How do we do labor? Well, labor's tricky because we need an exponentially growing workforce and we can't do slave labor. That didn't work out too well. So what do we do? Well, we tell ourselves bedtime stories about how we're gonna create slaves, but they won't be human. Humans. They'll be non humans. They'll be robots. They'll be AI. And we can exponentially grow them at the limitations of digital biases. And then that brings us to capital. How do we exponentially grow capital? That's a hard one. That really messed us up in 2008. So how do we exponentially grow it? Well, we do what we just did with labor. We digitize it and we create Fugazi currencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. And we hope that that will continue that growth trajectory that we all hope we're on. See, that was my thought until I read John's book. John's approach is a little different. He looks to the next generation who, despite their high anxiety and reliance on ubiquitous mobile internet, might in actual fact have the right stuff to create a new narrative for the future. How did he come to that conclusion? Well, surprisingly to me, it was simply by speaking with a group of friends in Brighton, England. So to find out why the future starts here, please put your hands together and join me in welcoming John Higgs to the Virtual Futures stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, that's very kind. 
So, John, I'm, I'm going to start with the, the premise of the book, which is the 1980s. Something happened in the 1980s, and we started to understand the future differently. We had this degree of pessimism when it came to understanding the future. What happened in the 80s? Yeah, well, we basically gave up in the future in the 80s. That's when, if you, I mean, if you look at mainstream culture, that's when all the sort of positive visions of our future just they just stopped. They just vanished. I mean, we used to have things like this Star Trek 1960s, the, the Jetsons, and, you know, we'd have, um, we'd have film, films like uh, Logan's Run or, or books like Brave New World that would go, hey, here's a wonderful future. Ha ha, it's a trick. It's really bad. But by the 80s, we stopped being able to do that because we could no longer invent a wonderful future. We could only see zombie apocalypses and, you know, environmental collapse, end of civilizations. Every single vision of the future in a mainstream movie from then has been awful, right? It's been a real dystopia. It's been nowhere you'd want to live. And it, the, t the last one, the last, last glimmer of positivity was Bill and Ted's bogus. <laughs> and they go, yeah, the future's good. The water slides are better. That was, that was our last positive vision of the future. And then they all just went and they all just disappeared. And if it's true that to build a future, you have to first imagine it, then that's really worrying. That's, that was my starting point, yeah. So, so when do you think this, this sort of human hubris came, not even human hubris, but this weird little existential crisis we're having about the future, why do we have this, what you call in the book, a circumambient narrative that it's all going potentially to shit? Well, I, th I think there's a lot of factors, but I think one of the most important is this rise of individualism in the 20th century, uh, especially for the baby boomers, Generation X like myself and the millennials. It was all this increasing sense of understanding the world through yourself first. Now, you're the fundamental thing, and that's what you use to understand everything else. And so when we look at the, the problems that are coming up, I'm thinking particularly climate change, I'm thinking of the biodiversity collapse, I'm thinking of inequality. Those are the, the three real big ones that we really have to tackle. The way we look at them, this is people raised in the 20th century, as we sort of think, well, I don't see why I should like, have to do anything. And if I'm not going to do anything, then these people, they aren't going to do anything. So nothing's going to happen. So we'll just sort of ignore it until the world, world ends. It's not, that, it's not that we didn't know how to solve these problems. It's that we didn't believe we would. And that's quite, you know, that's, that's quite the sort of the, the, the shocking thing. Suddenly though, come the 21st century and the shift in attitudes between millennials and Generation Z, the teenagers growing up now, I mean, if you speak to any uh, demographic researchers, they've just never seen anything like it. It's like all their graphs of attitudes of, uh, of, for over decades just suddenly go, Voof! they all shoot down. There's been this huge, phenomenal change of this generation that were raised entirely online, who've gone to secondary school with a smartphone in their hands, who no longer think that the individual is enough to understand things. And they automatically understand things in terms of networks, in terms of groups. They're thinking of how other people are feeling. They're much more empathetic. They're, they're, they have this greater extended circle of empathy. And they don't think, well, I'm not gonna do anything. They think, well, okay, well, let's come together, what are we gonna do? And this, this huge sh uh, shift, you'll see it in things like, um, uh, the, the climate uh, strikes, the school climate strikes uh, that the Greta Thunberg, uh, that she started, or, or the, uh, in America, the March for Our Lives movement, you know, because like millennials, like they had school shootings too, you know, they had, you know, climate change and they went, well, there's not much we can really do about that. Suddenly you hit this generation and, and the kids uh, who saw their, you know, their, their school friends killed in, in, in Florida, they, they start the largest protest in American history, that however many millions it was descending on Washington for the March for Our Lives. Or the you know, one, one and a half million kids have striked for the, the uh, uh, climate. This is not a generation that thinks, well, we won't do anything. So, you know, it's an entirely different attitude. 
And when you're talking about the future, you're thinking, oh, middle 21st century, we'll have those problems. How are we going to face them? How are we going to tackle them? You tend to sort of think, well, what would I do if I was there? You put yourself in, in their shoes, but you don't put yourselves in their minds, right? You, you, you don't view things with their perspective, their baggage, their prejudices, their attitude. You use your own. And that's a fatal flaw in futurism because the change in attitudes that's coming through now is just extraordinary. And it isn't going to be people thinking about these problems with 20th century minds and just going, well, we won't do anything. That's not going to happen. So once you start realizing this and you realize that people are going to attempt to, to build a future and create a future, that's when you start you know, trying to work out what that future will be and that's where it gets excited. Well, you, you have a special name in the book for this new generation, this, this Gen Z, and you call them the meta-modern generation. The, the only thing that scares me about your description of them is, is maybe they'll be able to solve these problems, but they are the generation that were born into the world of mobile internet. They have serious mental health issues, they have anxiety, lack of sleep, and they have a Xanax fetishism, but don't worry, they're going to save us in the future. You I know, it's hard that? on them, isn't it? It's really hard on them. This, I mean, this generation, their mental health is awful. Right? It's, it's, I mean, you really feel for them. It's so, it's so hard. I write, uh, there was a bit at the March for Our Lives thing in Washington. There was a wee girl called uh, Samantha Fuentes, and she was like 15, you know, and she'd seen her school friends killed. And she had to get up and address a crowd of about a million, you know, or at the, the march of about a million people, just people as far as the eye can see. And it was being broadcast live, you know, on, on American television. And she was so scared. She was so nervous that she was sick on the stage. She was just, she was sick behind the podium. And then she sort of just turned and went, I've just been sick live on American TV and it's amazing. And then she just launched into her speech with such fire and such passion and stuff like that. You know, it's hard for them. This, it's a side effect of this extended um, uh, uh, circle of empathy. When you're always worrying what other people are thinking, you're trying to put yourself in other people's minds. You're, try, you're trying to uh, think of all the permutations of all the different sort of things. It's... Your anxiety is awful, it worries awful, and yet these are the generation that it sort of falls to. You know, I feel bad, I feel like my generation really left them bad that, plate. That's what I've always found weird about Greta Th uh, Thunberg, the, the Extinction Rebellion girl, because she, she has massive anxiety. She admits on stage that she has this crazy anxiety about the end of the world coming, and you feel deeply, deeply sorry for her, but, and yet she's very politically active. So this meta modern generation that you're talking about, they can live within these weird dichotomies. And what is it about that that makes them so potentially special? Yeah, uh, I should probably define this word metamodern, because it's one of them words that like, oh God, that looks academic and that's really scary. Um, to put it simply, uh, it's what came after postmodernism, right? Uh, the 20th century, the late 20th century, is generally classed by artists, by academics, by sociologists as postmodern. And there's a whole, of diff a whole list of different uh, uh, cultural aspects that sort of go into this. But there's a, there's a real sort of understanding that, that, well, that was then, right? We've changed since then. What are we now? And people are trying to understand um, our current uh, overriding sort of culture uh, that's moved on from from this this postmodernism sort of thing, and there's this. It, at first, it seems utterly contradictory, because it seems to sort of be, you know, sincere and ironic. You know, it's it's optimistic and it's pessimistic. Um, and it comes down to this word meta. The word meta in meta modernism doesn't mean about yourself, as you might think. It comes from the Greek metaxi, which means of the two extremes. You know, uh, uh, the, the, in, in Greek myths, the, the heroes would be of gods, but also of men. It's, it's, this, this, it's not about the center ground. It's about the extremes and swinging between both the extremes. You can see it so clearly in our politics. You know, the, the, you know, the, the Tony Blair dad centrist sort of thing is just, just gone. And these wild extremes come into play. So it's you know, chaotic and it can be scary. And it can be, um, for someone raised in the 20th century like myself, you just think it's out of hand. This is, this is absolutely terrifying. This is awful. Uh, and yet what they're sort of doing is they're using what works in all these different 
aspects. They're not trying to be um, pure, right? They're not trying to be, you know, uh, uh, consistent or anything like that. Uh, uh, here's a good example. Um, this is America, Child Childish Gambino. Every, when that came out, everybody got it, right? Everybody loved it, right? This is a very, very meta-modern thing. Um, it's not a case that you have to understand the academic talk of it. You know, you just see it and you, and you just get it. And there were, um, there was a guy on the BBC saying, well, it's a little bit contradictory in that he's condemning, you know, the attitudes of, of America in which it loves black culture, but it hates black people. And yet he's using all these sort of Jim Crow aspects and he's, he's using all the thing he condemns. It could be seen as, you know, contradictory. And that's exactly the whole point. He uses all these things and you see it and you go, oh my God, that's amazing. And you, and you know, all the, the choreography thing, that's what immediately draws you to it. And then you watch it again and you see everything else that he's saying and everything else that's sort of going on. He's using the strength of both things to get that full, full effect. Um, so this, this sense of meta-modernism uh, being the sort of overriding uh, sense of where we are, uh, it takes a little bit of time to get your head around it. Once you get it, you, 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 you get it, right? You start seeing it everywhere. And one of the good things about metamodernism as compared to postmodernism is that postmodernism was just solely focused on the present. It had no real concept of the future. So you, you'd get books like The End of History, you know, coming out and things like that because there was just no sense of, of the future. Metamonyms, it's all over the place, but yeah, they have a future. Yeah, they're thinking about a future. Yeah, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's become something to be, to be cared about, yeah. So, so that ability to be uh, almost both extremely liberal and extremely conservative at the same time. That's a very good example. That's yeah. the thing that essentially is going to help that generation survive the 21st century. But it's not just that dichotomy, is it? It's, it's something else you posit in the book, which is high emotional intelligence. I mean... Is that really a thing that generation has? God, yeah, it really is. It, it's um, a, a classic example. If you've got any teenagers, right? I'm, I'm assuming most of you here are millennials or maybe Generation X or something like that. Watch The Breakfast Club, right? With current teenagers, with people raised in the 20th century, 21st century. Because it makes no sense at all. It's utter gibberish to them. Because for us, you know, the bad guy in that film was the, was the uh, authority figure, assistant principal Vernon. You, if you, if you know the Breakfast Club, there's these five teenagers, they're in detention, they all bond in opposition to this authority figure. To, to, to the Generation Z, he's just sort of doing his job, you know. He, his motivation is he wants behavior at school to be better. He comes in at a weekend to try and make this better. He's not the bad guy at all. He's a fool, sure. They paint him as an absolute fool, but light relief. The villain in the film is the very character that Generation X, like myself, saw as the hero. It was the Judd Nelson character, the bad boy, John Bender. Um, and we used to think, ah, oh, you know, he's, he's so cool, you know, he, he's, you know he, he doesn't bend to the system, you know, he plays by his own rules, he's, he's, uh, he's, you know, he's, you know, he's a pure individualist, he does whatever he wants, and we go, yeah, he's, he's the absolute hero. To teenagers now, they just think, what an arsehole. <laughs> and he's cruel. He's cruel to other people. He deliberately hurts other people and he makes them upset. Therefore, He's the villain. He's the villain. The, the emotional heart of the film is the geek character, a guy called Brian, who at uh, one point sort of admits that uh, he tried to commit suicide the week before. And it's sort of played for laughs in that he used a flare gun by mistake. And my generation, we sort of forget that detail. We don't, we don't think of that when we see that. We, we see the film ending with, with John Bender walking across the football field going like this. Well, yeah, simple minds. Yeah, that's... That's how we see the film. When that film ends like that for, for teenagers, they're like, what the hell? What the hell? Their level of emotional intelligence is just much better than ours because they're right. You know, he is an arsehole. He is cruel. He is the villain. And once you see it through their eyes, you, you get a bit embarrassed about how we didn't notice it, how we didn't realize it before. Molly Ringwald wrote a thing in the New Yorker 
And when she watched it with her daughter, uh, Molly Ringwald was an actress in it. She was about 17 at the time. Um, and there's a scene when uh, the ben, John Bender is under the table when hiding from a, te te a teacher. sorry, and, and it's implied that he touches her inappropriately under the table. And it's sort of played for laughs. And so she wrote this article trying to understand why that seemed all right at the time. Uh, it, it really isn't. Uh, and we couldn't see it. We just couldn't see it. But the generation coming up now, yeah, they see it. They get it. They totally understand it. They're, they're, they're greater emotional intelligence. This growing up understanding themselves as part of networks and all these things I've been talking about. It's, it's a significant shift. And it's a good thing. I mean, it's hard for them, but it's a good thing. I mean, the, the problem comes when you have that sort of degree of high emotional intelligence and things like identity politics start to emerge, which are, are flawed, but you say in the book they're also useful. Yeah, there's a lot of um, oh, baby boomer intellectuals, right, for, for want of a better phrase, like that Canadian guy whose name you'll Jordan remember. Peterson. Jordan Peterson. Jordan um, Peterson. Stephen Pinker is another one on a completely different aspect. They, they're, they're a generation that anything that whiffs of postmodernism they hate and they, they don't get it and they want to go back to how it was before. Uh, and they, they often use the same arguments about identity politics, which is that essentially they're bollocks, really. There's, just, there's, a, th there's a thousand ways you can divide you know, a population of people, you know you know, height, intelligence, all these different sort of aspects you could use to divide people, wealth, class, um, you know, there's, uh, you, you could go on forever. There's a th so many different ways. And just to, to reduce it just to ethnicity, to, to sexuality, to, to, to issues like that, to reduce people to these small categories is essentially bollocks. And the thing is, that they are right. But what they don't get is to do that is really useful because it really uh, illustrates the systematic biases in so many organizations and in culture and, and things like that. By looking at things in terms of gender, by looking at things in terms of ethnicity and sexuality and stuff, it throws up a, a, a really useful, profound insight. So for the meta modern generation Z, that's what matters, okay? Intellectually, it may not be pure. Intellectually, it may not be a thing you'd, you'd defend in an academic paper and, and, you know, it's not the hill you'd die on. But while it works, while it's useful, then sure, let's use it. Sure, let's do it. Well, then the problem with something like identity politics is it gives us these, these emotional safe spaces. But again, is that a byproduct to the sort of environment that the metamodern generation has grown up in? They've grown up in a, a digital environment whereby they are hyper aware of not physical interaction, but language based interaction via digital networks. So emotional safe spaces in the real world almost kind of make sense. Because they are physically, they're the safest generation that, that, that you know we've ever had. Uh, they spend so much time in their rooms for a start. They're not get, they're not going out stealing cars and getting wrecked, wrecked. And you know their teenage pregnancies are right down. Arrests are right down. Um, you know they're, they're 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 healthy. They sort of look after themselves. They're not at physical risk of danger, but it's it's emotional danger that they fear. It's 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 it's. Um, it's, it's a strange shift. It used to be that, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words would never hurt me. That was, a, you know, a sort of common thing. It was physical things that we fear. It's very much emotional um, uh, hurt uh, that they fear. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting shift. And, what, and once you sort of see the shift from external things to internal things, a lot of all that stuff about trigger warnings and safe spaces and, and things that my generation would tend to sniff at suddenly makes a lot more sense, you know. Uh, we didn't, emotional hurt meant nothing to us, but it, for these people, it really is important. It's a really big, you know, big thing. But, but doesn't it feel like, with, with Generation Z, I feel so weird doing generational talks. Um, not that old. The youngins, um, but with, the kids. With, with Generation Z, the, there's no rebelliousness in them. They're, they're, they're almost like the generation, I think they've been called Generation Yawn or Generation Sensible or Generation Snore. I mean, they're not you, very exciting, are they? Usually by baby boomer journalists. They were just going, they're just not alcoholics. What's the matter with them? It's like, it's like they don't seem to think that being an alcoholic is great. What's the matter with them? 
there's uh, this 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 dismissive term snowflake that's usually uh, applied to them. I mean, sure, every, you know, it's not, it's not usual for, or it's not unusual for a generation to come along and go, I don't understand the kids, they're rubbish. You know, they're, they're terrible. Um, and it's been, and the, the, the sensibleness um, of this generation has really wound up a lot of older people. You know, <laughs> they're, so, they're so conservative on many issues. They, they, you know, they're so concerned like fiscal responsibility and, and uh, all, all these sort of things and law abiding, they're really law abiding. and They're not that interested in getting a driver's license and having that sort of independence or, or anything like that. Yeah, at the same time, they're so, um, the other side in terms of liberal matters like, like trans rights is, is a great one, uh, a, a great example because it used to be, if you think of things like gay rights or civil rights or universal suffrage or something like that, what used to happen was there'd be, uh, you know, a campaign that would go on for many decades that would slowly get the idea across in, to, the, to the culture at large, to legal circles, and slowly we'd sort of get change uh, through, through that way. Trans rights didn't happen like that. It was just like this generation got it. And then they sort of explained it to the rest of us. And I was like going, oh, hang on, if sex and gender aren't the same. <gasps> now my Prince records make sense. Why could nobody explain Prince to me at the time? My God, I get it now. This is, you know, uh, to have the youngins that wise is a little bit embarrassing at times, but yeah. So, so in, in that case, where, is that where this pessimism is coming from? The assumption from a from a millennial generation or even a, a Gen X generation that essentially the way in which the future works is an arrowhead version of the future whereby versions of technology today will kind of look similar but better in the future. Do we have to come to terms with the fact that the arrowhead way of predicting the future is, is fundamentally flawed? Uh, yeah, absolutely. There's a couple of things there, but yeah, the this 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 uh, arrow, I talk a lot about the arrow flight projection uh, in the book. This is the idea where uh, you, if you get some, uh, this is what sci-fi writers do. Something new will be invented, and they think, well, can you imagine, you know, a much more powerful, a much better version of that as a, you know, a direct progression, and that'll be the future. Um, it's sort of like if you get, if you had, you know, a baby, a little baby boy, and you go, yeah, that's that's going to grow up to be like. Dwayne the Rock Johnson, right? And it might do, you know, it, it, Dwayne the Rock Johnson did, but most people, they just go a bit other way, you know, they're not, it's not a complete direct flight. It's things like, um, uh, you know, jetpacks. That was, that was the thing. Oh, we'll all get jetpacks. We've got, we've invented jetpacks, we'll get better and more powerful and cheaper, and then everyone will have jetpacks. In the Jetsons, even like the dog has a jetpack, and the kids, they all have jetpacks, and that was supposed to be the, the, the future. And it hasn't happened because that's ridiculous. <laughs> jetpacks? We would die. It would just be insane. It's just a ridiculous idea. Um, most most progressions just aren't like that. They're just not this direct on thing. The big difference, however, is uh, Moore's law in the computer world, which was predicted that the chips would advance double, you know, every eighteen months or, or whatever. And this was predicted in I think about 1974. And it's only really just failed. It's just been, you know, the past few decades of the computer industry have, have been running on this sense that, well, every 18 months or so, everything's going to double, everything's going to get cheaper, and we'll plan for that, and, you know, our software will plan for that, and, uh, and everything. So people in the computer industry, they tend to, that tends to be their mindset. They go, well, we've invented an AI. Uh, in five years' time, it will take over the world and have us all killed. Right, that's the straight, straight sort of projection. It really doesn't work like that. It re very, very few examples that it works like that. Moore's Law was one of them. Uh, but, but because that's so central to our understanding of technology, we tend to apply it to an awful lot of things. I talk a lot about what AI can do, but also what it can't do. And the assumptions that people make about what it will do are really based on nothing. They really are. Well, you do look at AI as the thing that can, uh, I mean, generate narratives. And in the case of um, one of the examples of the Algo Higgs, you, you have a, a friend who creates a robot version of you that injects all of your past writing to spit out a, a version of this book, which, uh, which you have here. But th there's something interesting in what you say about watching that Algo Higgs emerge, because it kind of reveals the issue that we have when it comes to predicting the future. What we put in is what we get 
out. So if we're putting in all the information from the present, what we're going to get is a very warped version of that present as a version of our future, and maybe that's where futurists fall over. They try to predict the future with the information they have currently. So how do we get away from that, that trick? How do we get away from doing that sort of bad futurism? Yeah, um, uh, good question. Well, I'll just... I'll get round to that. Uh, I, I just you started you started mentioning Algo Higgs, which, um, as I say, a friend of mine, he sort of took it on himself to do this. Like I didn't ask him. <laughs> he just decided, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll replace you. I'll, I'll build an AI. I'll feed it all your books. It'll learn to write like you, and I'll I'll be able to press a button, and it'll turn out a book, and then that'll be the end of your career. And that's that's sort. Of, <laughs> I say he's a friend, you know. Um, which is what we've done, and I've brought these along. Uh, I don't know if, if you get my newsletter or things like this. We've printed up a hundred of these, which are for anyone who will give a donation to Shelter. I've got a wee Shelter uh, thing there. If you want a copy of this, and you'll, you just make a donation to Shelter and buy, help yourself, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phenomenal thing. I'm just going to... Shall I read you a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm bearing in mind this is how a computer understands me. All right. It's not a good end for a summer's day, I think, but I keep drinking and talking to my dogs. They remind me of African panthers, which is ironic because they are quite frightening. <laughs> Eric and I head out into the sand under the rock. We find a small field full of dead animals. <laughs> we find a snake, its head and tail left lying on the beach that seems to be some, yeah. it seems to be some form of animal remains. We find a woman, aged in all but name. <laughs> That's better than any sentence I've ever written. <laughs> if I understood it, I would steal it. We find a woman, aged in all but name, who is in bed with us. <laughs> she wears a spit back quiff, a leather jacket over a black knight corset, and wears a kind, kind finger on her right hoof. <laughs> when I go back to find out what has happened to her, I ask her what it is that counts as a crime. She shakes her head in a way that I can only assume was sarcasm. And there's 30,000 words of this stuff. <laughs> and, where, and none of us have read it, okay? And, I think it might be better than anything I've ever done myself, which is the really the scariest part of it. Um, so if you want a copy, I just have about 10 with me. And if you're just prepared to make a, generation, a donation, whatever you think, to shelter, come and get one after me. I, there was a few books on sale as well that I, I've written. And, you know, <laughs> but this is the one. Okay. So, 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 so long story short, AI terrible at predicting the future. Yes, it's about what AI, X, AI has no understanding that the world exists, that it exists, that, uh, you know, the, the notion that it's going to come to life and understand the world and decide, oh, I think I'll, uh, I think I'll wipe out humanity. Um, it's something we project on it all the time. There was a big, uh, it, was, it was front page news in the sun, you know, uh, when Facebook had these two chat bots that they had to switch off because they started talking in a code. Um, of their own devising, and no one could understand them. And the way the story was presented, it was a huge story around the world, because the assumption was, well, if they've started talking in a code, they must be, you know, they must have things they don't want us to know. And if, if they've got things they don't want us to know, they must be planning something awful. Right? And so that became the story. And at no point did journalists go, yeah, no, they, they have no concept that, we exist. They have no concept that they exist. You know, they have no, no understanding of what a neural network was, all these, all these uh, weights and nodes just shifting their, their values between each other at all. We project, um, we, we personify these things because they do things that look a bit like human. You know, Turing was dead right when he was trying to find a test for artificial intelligence. He didn't define what intelligence was. He said it's something that can appear to be human uh, and no playing with our own biases or, or attempts to project our own um, understanding of 
uh, of ourselves onto the onto these things that are very very different and that just simply do not have an understanding of what it is they are or what it is they're doing you know it's it's the idea that they're suddenly going to become consciousness right the evidence for that is absolutely zero it's probably less when you look when you look at the way that consciousness seems to be linked as much to you know the uh, the uh, the emotional meat that is our brains the, the the whole biochemical soup as much as it is to the, the connections between them which is what AI models you know it's probably less than zero I'd say I, I always think that I mean when these guys Elon and Co go oh God AI it's gonna it's gonna come and kill us I always think it's just very good marketing I think they know it can't do what they're promising but if they say it's gonna be that good then it can do this silly little thing with their with their data from their company it that they could can then come and kill us if it was designed to kill us right if someone said I'll build an AI that will just go and shoot a room full of people right it would do that that's 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 true but it's a tool and like any tools, the person who uses it is responsible for it. So it's not the case that AI is coming for your job. It's the case that your boss is going to sack you when he's got a cheaper thing that will, will do it for you. And that might seem like a pedantic difference. But in terms of legislating for it, in, in, ter in terms of, you know, uh, building laws and understanding it, you have to re remember that the person who's using the tool is responsible for it. So if Elon Musk builds uh, an AI machine to come in and, and shoot up this room, right? It's Elon Musk's fault, right? It's it's him you blame. You don't blame the tool. Well, that's a, that's a whole other that's a whole other virtual futures, but... I don't think he would, by the way. I'm, I'm <laughs> fond of Elon Musk on a number of levels. Is he that, wouldn't do that. Well, you never know. Um, but there is something interesting with regards to... If AI understands so little about the world as, as proven by how it's constructing... Algo Higgs or how it's constructing your... We, we have to set the goal. That's the thing. It's well, the thing it can't do. But, but then it comes back around that it's creating our reality tunnels. It's, it's to a degree we live, whether we like it or not, we live in this human world, in the world of nature, and we live in this world of data. And as we're realizing very, very quickly, AI and the way in which it uh, looks at our news feeds or social media profiles, it is creating a, a worldview that we are creating a feedback loop with. And to Absolutely. some degree, that's slightly dangerous. I mean, AI yeah. is is great when it comes to churning big data, but when it comes to creating new reality tunnels and affecting how we perceive the world, then we're in real trouble. Totally, absolutely. Um, you know, the reality tunnel for AI is the data that it's fed. That's how it stands. And like our own reality tunnels, it's flawed and it's full of bias and it's full of mistakes and it's full of errors and it's not how the world really is. It's close enough to be useful, you know. Our, our own um, psychological flaws are in this data and so they're in AI itself. Uh, and you're right, it is, it is being used uh, to create uh, reality tunnels and, and, and things like Facebook feeds and, and things like that. Um, so, so I wonder to a degree, is, that, is it responsible for the pessimism that we have around the future? If the news cycle, which is algori algorithmically fed to us through social media, if that is driven by AIs that are creating certain degrees of reality tunnel, then is that creating the mythos that we have about the world? So in other words, news has to get our attention, so it shows us terrible things about the world coming to an end, and therefore we just accept that that must be our inevitable future, and feedback loop, feedback loop, ad infinitum. Yeah, it is, right? Right? Because it's programmed to be like that, and it's programmed to be like that because it works. And the reason it works is because for people raised in the 20th century uh, who don't, who can't imagine a, 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 an impressive future, uh, they to be fed um, fear and negativity uh, presses their buttons on all sorts of levels. Uh, it's it's a real um, what's a good way to describe it. Um, Oh, I'll, it'll come to me, but yeah, it, it works because that's what we're sort of, it's, it's like, if say a guy comes on TV and he says, oh uh, yeah, this thing, yeah, this thing, it's awful, right, it's terrible, right, we automatically go, oh, mm, and, and, and treat this respect and take it seriously, whereas if someone comes on TV and says, oh, this thing, yeah, it's great, right? it's brilliant, you should get it, we're sort of like, suspicious like is, are they just trying to sell something because that's not what we normally see we expect we expect bad things we expect the darkness we expect um 
the sort of grumpy old man view of the world. And there's definitely a place for that. Absolutely. You know, the, um, uh, if you criticize something, it's because you find a flaw in it, right? That's great. That's useful. Once you understand the flaw, maybe we can do things better. That's absolutely fine. You know, we all like to grumble sometimes. And if you can do it and for a reason, absolutely. But when it's just this constant knee jerk, uh, automatic negativity, and to get this, 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 this corrosive pessimism, this assumption that, oh God, everything's terrible. There's a thing, oh God, it's terrible, right? We're totally out of balance, absolutely out of balance, because we really need both things, but we're only getting the one. We're only getting the negativity, we're not getting the positivity. Uh, and because that's what being raised as individuals appeals to us, that's why the algorithms do it. There's, there is something almost very odd that when it comes to negativity, we treat it very seriously, but when it comes to optimism, we treat it very suspiciously. And, and perhaps that's something to do with advertising. And as you just said, I mean, we see the advertising message, we just assume, oh, it must be wonderfully positive. What are they trying to sell? Definitely. What's going on? And whereas news, it's trying to get a reaction, it's looking for a click, it's trying to get a reaction. And it knows giving you some negative, some fear, some, some, something to be disgusted by. We'll get that reaction, we'll get that click, we'll get that comment and, and things like that. It goes towards that. So the only real places you see in our culture of people going, you know, are adverts. And we know they're lying to us. So we know that's suspicious. So we treat positive messages with suspicion, you know. Is, is that why, and you look at this, partly in the book, is, is that why the climate message is such a negative message? It always feels like the futurists are coming onto the news, and they're coming onto Sky News, they're coming onto CNN, and they're going, all right, we're going to tell you how bad it's going to be. We're going to tell you how many inches of water that Miami is going to be under in the next 25 years. We're going to tell you how bad the drought is going to be in Africa. They never give us the, the roadmap to how we're actually going to overcome these sorts of terrible things. What possibly we could do to avert this crisis in the first place. Absolutely. I mean, there was the huge UN report a couple of weeks ago on uh, the biodiversity uh, crisis. And it was, it was like 1,800 pages and every page was just like awful and horrifying and terrifying. And, you know, it did get a lot of coverage, but at no point in that, you know, about a, a million species, they reckon, a million species are endangered. That was the sort of headline, uh, which got coverage. But at no point in any coverage did I see, did they say go, but, you know, we do know like how to stop this, right? We, we do know how to stop the collapse in biodiversity. Um, if you want to know, there's a place 14 miles north of Brighton called NEPP, K-N-E-P-P. -P. It was a marginal bit of farmland, three and a half thousand acres. The, the owners couldn't really get it working. So at some point after millennium, they decided to stop being farmers and just turn it over to nature. But what they did was they thought, well, we'll introduce all the right species for what the ecosystem would be like after the Ice Age. So they introduced longhorn cattle and, and, and snuffling pigs and, and some deer. And as, you know, they weren't allowed to put like a, a, a lynx, which they really wanted, because the Sussex dog walkers wouldn't have had it, but you know, as best they could. And then they stopped putting pesticides, stopped putting fungicides, stopped draining the land, and they just left it. And the, the change has just been phenomenal. And just, just like 10 years, uh, well, even before then, just every single level of life has just come roaring back. And you go there now, and like the first thing you notice is the noise. And the place just feels alive. And it tends to get headlines for things like pretty species like turtle doves or the purple emperor butterfly things that uh, were very near extinction and people have tried to save and they've you know they've put a bit of land aside and put the things that purple emperor butterflies would like and hope that they'd get some turning up and it's never sort of worked it tends to get attention for sort of key species like that um but while sure that's great that all those things have come back it's it's they, they didn't plan it. They didn't aim for it. They just let every single level from the insects to the, to the fungus, to the soil itself, to the mammals, the amphibians, the birds have just come roaring in. The whole rewilding uh, movement 
um, is exactly how you fix biodiversity. Uh, and it just needs more and more land being put aside, which is happening. And this is happening. And sure, let's accelerate it as much as we can. Um, but it's not newsworthy to say that, you know, oh, the UN have, have, have said a million species are going to die. We'll have to do these things to stop them. You know, that's not the news sort of gives up at that point and just just gives you leaves you feeling awful. which leaves you feeling terrible. So in that case, do we need to reorient the narrative around it being a struggle or it being a fight and reorient it around allowing for these sorts of gradual changes to our climate and also the, could this be a metaphor in a weird sort of way for how we should re-engineer culture we shouldn't do it from top down we should allow it to happen bottom up yeah absolutely that's it that is that's exactly what it is it's um once you realize that well to go back to nature i was sort of I just, the impression i sort of had from the media was that nature was like it was like frail right it was like this sickly sort of thing. And it needed us to sort of nurse it back to health. And, and having visited this net place uh, at the, in dusk in autumn when there's the deer rut, which is when the deer sort of go mad and they just fight each other. It's like there's pheromones everywhere. And it's sort of like a cross between Bambi and the Purge. It's just, just wow. It's fantastic. Um, you get there, you just hear the bellowing and the clank of a fuse and, and uh, the, horn, the antlers clashing. You realize that, oh, nature ain't this frail thing at all. Like, nature's like raw, man. Nature's going to come roaring back if we just sort of got out of the way and just sort of left it. Um, this, I've, that's not answered your question the slightest, does it? So what was, <laughs> where, where's, where's that supposed to be going? Well, well I was going to ask the, this idea of just getting out the way and leaving it to re-engineer itself. I mean, is that something we should look at for culture? We're trying to engineer yeah. culture top down to try and deal with these uncertain futures, but should we just take a step back and let the thing run its course? Uh, exactly as you, as you say. And a large part of that is because we've learned enough not to trust things like Facebook, sort of big media corporations. We know they don't have our best interest at heart. They, we know they manipulate us in ways that uh, make our lives worse. Um, when those are the places that we normally get culture, the reaction is to turn away from them. The reaction is to turn to things you, you do trust, which is your mates, you know, your friends, you know, the, the, the people, your family and, and the people you work with. And, and that's where you find culture. You know, that's where you, fi you, you find meaning. That's where you find purpose and coming together and creating your own stories, creating your own myths, uh, putting on events, doing things, just coming together and doing stuff, right? Suddenly, there's, that's much more powerful, much more rewarding much more fun, you know, than what Facebook is pushing on you. You know, you can you can have a bit of both and balance, but this this sort of bottom down uh, understanding of culture as something that's not just for consumers, right? Not just for critics. Something you have to roll your sleeves up and and, and start playing with and, and seeing what you can do. That I'm seeing an awful an awful lot more of an awful lot more of. And I think that's a very, very important part of where uh, the future's going, especially if we do get things like universal basic income or, or, or some way of dealing with the, the lack of jobs through AI or, or, or something like that. A world that becomes an, 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 a sustainable economic system that is no longer about getting stuff, you know, getting money, right? making money. It it's when you don't have that, it becomes much more about making meaning, you know, making purpose, you know. Uh, and when you start seeing all these things start to growing and appearing in our future, you suddenly have the God. If we if we, if we do have a future, it's I kind of like. I kind of like to live in it. It looks like kind of good. That would work for me. That would be that would be a place worth building. You know, that would be a future worth building, which is which is an image we just not. It's been so absent for so long in our in our culture. You, you use uh, Peter Landon Wilson or Hacken Bay's term. Uh, Immediate or mediatism, immediatism. Sorry, to to kind of describe that a little more 
um, with a little more focus. So, I mean, what is immediatism and, and why is it so important? So what essentially is the core message of this book, which is maybe we should retrieve something that's quite interesting about one-to-one -one human communication, and that's where we find new narratives for the future. So, so what is it about the term immediatism? Yeah, uh, this is the term that comes from uh, a writer called Hakim Bey, who it has to be mentioned is a wrong un, right? But don't putting that aside, putting that aside, um, he he wrote a couple of books. Taz, uh, total uh, total autonomous zone. Um, is it total? Temporary autonomous. Temperate. Zone. Sorry, yeah. Sorry. It's virtual futures yeah. crowd. They yeah, read yeah, 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 yeah. I knew that was wrong. Temperate autonomous zone, which is hugely influential. You just saw in the Extinction Rebellion things when they took over various parts of London and stuff like that. That's using the same tactics as um, reclaim the streets which got it all, you know, from, from the, this idea of this Taz, from, from, from Hacking Bay. Um, the, uh, the Burning Man Festival in, in America is another example of using the ideas of Hacking Bay. But he also defines this thing called immediatism. Uh, and it's sort of got two meanings. Um, uh, one is how mediated something is. Whereas you and me just having a conversation here is like, pure and spontaneous and like anything can happen and you know we're to totally in the moment and it's very different to you know making a film where you need hundreds of people and you plan it for months and and you know the more money things cost the more mediated they they tend to come the more things come between the actual connection the actual sort of uh thing that matters really uh, and, and often artists become artists because they want to express what it is that they experience and what what it is they feel and the more uh, successful they get the more um you know the more of an audience the more bigger the, the act of making it puts so many different layers between what it is that they're trying to express and, them, and themselves it gets much more mediated so he, he he stresses that the um uh the less mediated something is the better but also the uh, immediatism as in just doing it immediately just coming together uh, with a group of people uh, and doing something now and the hard part of that is coming together with you know your group of people because there's always a there's always a reason not to isn't there there's always you know you got work and it's it's it's, it's very easy to go oh, i can't do it thursday can we do it next friday you know so, or something like that but once you all get together then a project appears and there's always a project you know there's always something that appears once you get together then that's the that's the the the, the, the main problem over and done with you'll find that the that the um that what then happens is utterly unpredictable um is, is something you would never have imagined uh and will be far more important to you personally and mean much more to you on, on an emotional level than you know a whole year's worth of you know netflix box sets and and things like that as as good as netflix box sets oh i'm so so lovely you came out on game of thrones final night i really really appreciate that after I didn't really think anyone would come on Game of Thrones. <laughs> well, in, in that case, it doesn't sound like the future is going to be as tragic as we imagined. And in actual fact, you posit in the book that it, it might not be a tragedy, it might actually be a comedy. Because they're, from the inside, they're, you can't tell the difference. Uh, this, this is going back to you know, the original Greek definitions of these things. Um, uh, a, a tragedy, the difference between a tragedy and a comedy would be how it sort of turns out, you know. Uh, a, a comedy would look like a tragedy right until the twist at the end, right until the final reveal, uh, when then suddenly everything's fine and people just get married and they, they find what they're looking for and there's union and all these things. Whereas in a tragedy, that just wouldn't happen. It would just be, you know, a, a, com a complete uh, uh, disaster. So there's the sense that for all we're convinced we're living in a tragedy, it might not be might be a really strange comedy that we don't don't quite get yet but you know could, could it be as far as a sitcom yeah i used i used i used the notion that it's a sitcom when i'm looking for a, a sustainable story structure because all these things they come to an end oh but not sitcoms not a good sitcom uh, a sitcom it's every episode sort of resets you know uh, so it can go on forever and ever. And something like The Simpsons is still going on after 20 odd years and, and things like that. It's a sustainable story structure that we still 
want to visit you know we still love we still like to go back and you know see see the old friends and and, and see all the things we loved about it uh and so if our world is not a tragedy there is a chance it might be a sitcom <laughs> and if if we use that as our story for understanding things let's just see how that works well, in that case, let's bring some other characters into the sitcom. We have time for audience questions. There's, there's a mic going around. Please wait until you get the mic um, to ask your question because we're recording this. Um, any burning questions about the future? You've, you've answered everything, John. Or I, just, I, I can't see anything. This gentleman here. Uh -huh. uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned about the idea that we should try to be a bit more bottom up, we shouldn't try to have these sort of more controlling narratives and, 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 and things like that, and actually just getting out of the way might be a, a, the best thing. With something like climate, it, it, that feels quite, especially when the, the, all the generations that are in charge are the people that are quite individualist, that seems worrying to me. And Totally. Uh, you know, I would quite like something to just come along and fix it sometimes. Um, I just wonder if you had a thought on that. Yeah, I mean, climate is something that you can't just sit back and assume it's, you know, it'll all be fine. You have to do, you have to tackle it. Uh, there is, there is, a, uh, I mean, I'm thinking of things like the Greg's Vegan Sausage Roll, right? Nobody would have expected that. No one would have thought a vegan sausage roll would have turned around the fortunes of Greg's the Bakers and become a sort of much sought after sort of thing. This move to veganism that's happened in the, in the, in the past few years, and you'll see it in any shop or, or these, uh, these really meat-like burgers that you could just get in any pub around, that feels a lot more bottom-up and sort of unexpected, definitely. Um, we can't rely on that for climate, not at all. It needs massive international cooperation that needs massive laws. But... The understanding of Extinction Rebellion, of the school climate change, that for God's sake, we have to do this now. Stop excuses. We have to do this. No, you're making excuses. We have to do this. Okay, you're ready. No, no, you're making excuses. Let's ha have to do this. This real dogged sort of uh, thing uh, that, that does... It's, it's, you can't, it's not entirely on this one generation, but the, it's, it's definitely a, a shift is occurring. You know, the baby boomers are starting to die out. The Generation Z are starting to enter the electorate. And they're not like, you know, millennials who are famous for not bothering to vote, right? They can't be bothered to vote, generalizing. They really want to vote. They really can't wait to vote. So there, there, there is this shift in the political system uh, occurring. Um, and it is, there is reason for hope, but not for complacency. We can't be complacent. You know, we can't just sit back and expect it, things to be. But we are missing out on a lot of good news. I mean, well, we've just had the longest period without using coal in this country. Our carbon emissions uh, are the lowest, with the exception of years of n national strikes, since I think about 1888, I want to say. Uh, you know, there's, there is very, very good news out there. Things are changing, and we never hear about them, so we just assume it's all doomed. It's not enough. We have to do more. And when on, on the 23rd, when we go to vote, that's the most important thing. You know, that's the, the climate issue is the most important thing. But there is, as I say, there is a sort of bottom-up sort of change. People just, like, wanting vegan burgers. All of a sudden, that there wasn't there a few years ago, and, and, and that's... Well, you, heartening that's hopeful i think you go one step further in the book john because you you flirt with eo wilson's idea of half earth now do you think that could ever be a possibility yeah i love this idea i love the idea of half earth the i, I, I talked a bit about rewilding earlier uh and uh eo wilson has argued that we need to put aside half the earth for nature and then we do what the fuck we like with the other half, and it'll still be fine, and there won't be the biodiversity collapse and, and all that sort of stuff. And at first you think, oh, that's a bit utopian, putting aside half the earth, you know. But if, if you look at the, you know, national um, uh, forests and protected lands and national parks and things like that, it's something like 17% of the earth's popula uh, uh, 
of the earth's land at the moment and it's going to be 20 by uh, i forget the exact figures but it's, it's definitely sort of moving that way and there's this huge um change of lifestyle from people leaving the countryside and coming to live in cities which is much much sort of greener that is happening anyway there's a lot of um villages becoming marginal and not really sort of sort of working there's a lot of farmland being abandoned because it's marginal there is a move away from the land that if all the right policies were sort of put together then sure you know it's going it's going to be hard to go from about 20% to 50% but every 1% is like a real cause for uh, delight you know every 1% of extra land that's given over to nature um is a, is a, is a is a victory it's a real achievement and it's the opposite of how we normally see environmentalism which is that it's a series of defeats you know and we, we 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 try and we try and we try and we maybe win one battle but we're going to lose the war and it's seen in much more in military terms uh, it's it's much more sort of combative it's 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 a war we're losing and all those, those sort of stories that are, probably aren't helping when you see the sense of growing the uh, the amount of uh, land put aside for nature happening already and then policies increasing it and speeding it up and then when you realize that when it hits a certain point then that's you know our future is on earth we're not going off into space for, for, for certainly for centuries you know we have to make it work here we have to be able to live here and when you realize that, that mankind and nature sort of digitally enhance mankind and nature they're sort of the the different characters in our own sitcom, you know, who are all sort of stuck together, whether they like it or not, but they sort of have to sort of make it work. Um, it is it is a vision that makes sense to me, I think. Any other questions at all? So I can't see the mic. So Ben, you pick. Um, if I may ask a question about history rather than the future. I sure. was really interested when you said in the 80s, it, all sort of optimism for the future went away and everything became dystopian. Do you have a theory on why that happened then? Yeah, uh, well, as, uh, as, with all these things, there's a number of factors. I mean, I remember 1980 started with the Protect and Survive brochure going to every single house in the country. Does anyone remember the Protect and Survive pamphlet? Oh, man, it was terrifying. It's, I've got one at home. Uh, if you can get one, they, they are available. Uh, if you're too young for this, um, in every house in the country in 1980 got a pamphlet about what to do in, the, uh, in a global nuclear war. Right. And it was all about taking your doors off the hinges and putting them against the wall. It was, it was about putting your granny in a bin bag and leaving her out in the street after she died. It was that sort of level of, of horror. Right. And in the 80s, the threat of, of nuclear war was so real. You know, we didn't really think we, that we probably would have a future for a lot of people. You'd see films like Threads in about 1984, Where the Wind Blows, 1987, something like that. Um, there, was, there was this terrible Sting song in the 80s called Russians. And he'd sing, I hope the Russians love their children too. Like the Russians are some alien species that we didn't understand or anything like that. The threat of nuclear war was so real. And it, yes, it receded um, towards the end of the 80s with Gorbachev and Reagan and the, the INT tr Treaty and stuff like that. But by that point, we had the uh, an understanding of, of climate change. Uh, people pretend we didn't, but that's when it became the first became aware of it. In fact, it was Margaret Thatcher, of all people, who took it to the global stage and gave this big speech at the UN General Assembly about how we all had to come together and tackle climate change or else the planet would burn and all this sort of stuff. So excuse to get rid of miners, that's what it was. These guys uh, yeah, are causing oh, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 not, I'm <laughs> definitely not disagreeing with that, absolutely. Um, but the, 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 the sense of having no future from a nuclear point of view leading to an environmental point of view coupled with this increasing individualism that didn't see coming together with people to solve problems as a as a, as a reality this is this all this is the whole soup of, of of things coming up there's there's a, a thing i mentioned in the book about the film star trek 2 the wrath of khan right about this big argument between Gene Roddenberry, who invented Star Trek and saw it as this utopian thing, uh, and the guy who's producing that film and making that film. And it was about a no smoking sign on the bridge of the USS Enterprise. Right? 
And Gene Roddenberry was like, you can't have a no smoking sign on the Enterprise. People aren't going to be smoking in the 23rd century. And the reaction was, don't be stupid. Of course they will be, you know. And the belief was people wouldn't change. And Roddenberry was the opposite. He said, people will get better. And he lost that argument because the rest of the, the, the producers and things like this thought that no, people would not get better, right? That, 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 that utopian light just had gone out in the 80s like that. We stopped, we stopped believing we'd get better. So yeah, a whole, whole host of things happened then, yeah. So. Any other questions at all? Um, hi, John, thank you so much. It's been a uh, cracking uh, thought-provoking hour. Uh, oh, thank you very much. Um, I was really interested with your uh, with what you were talking about with the emotional intelligence of this this uh, current, I guess, post-millennial uh, generation, the the meta modern yeah. generation. Um, I've had the good fortune of working with young people of that age at the moment, and uh, I wanted to ask if if there was a threat to that emotional intelligence that you could perceive in the future, what would you suggest that could be? If there was something Zanet. that was possibly gonna curtail what we would see as a burgeoning in emotional intel intelligence in young people these days, if we can assume that it would at one point dissipate, what uh, would be the cause? I would not assume that it would dissipate because of the way that the generations work, is that a generation will come along, say, uh, you know, the baby boomers came along and they, they, they celebrated this, this teenage period, this, this adolescence and things like that. Then the, uh, and there's usually some flaw in what they do. They come on and go, oh, this is wonderful, but there's a flaw. Then the next generation come along. So the Generation X came and they saw what uh, baby boomers had done with, with um, this sort of liberating individualism and this extended childhood and this sense of playing. They go, we really like that. But they sort of thought they were being a bit naive about things. It was this terrible naivety. So they didn't take the naivety and it became a lot more sort of nihilistic. Uh, and then the millennials sort of came along and they saw what Generation X were doing, but they saw the nihilism. They didn't want anything of the nihilism. So they became a lot more sincere. There's the there's there's sense that the, the generations will take everything of use, of positive value, that's good from the generation before, without credit, without thinking, oh, we got it from them. You know, that's just natural, of course, it's just normal, we'll, we'll just sort of have that. Uh, and then try and, you know, improve on the, the things that aren't working. It's, it's like the punks go, oh, we're so different to the hippies, absolutely, completely different to the hippies, we're nothing like the hippies. But they took their sort of their DIY ethos, you know, their, their, their um, interesting alternative lifestyles. Their, there's so much of the punk thing um, came from the hippies that they didn't sort of recognize. Um, so I don't think the positive parts are rejected, but it, the fear is more... The, the overwhelming pressure, the, the anxiety, the sort of the mental health issues that we've sort of talked about uh, will just overwhelm so many of them that they'll sort of retreat into themselves. Um, hopefully not, because to retreat into yourself is... Well, I'm writing a thing about William Blake, so I can give you a really long answer on, on that. But I won't, it's, not, it's not a good thing anyway at the moment, um, if that answers your question. I mean, I tend to disagree, uh, and maybe it's because I spent the last year or so in the US, but if anything, it's going to be Xanax. It's going to be the availability of drugs to, to put them back onto the scale of am I normal? And that's what these kids are asking us. Like, I have this anxiety, is this normal? If we treat them as if it's not normal and then drug them up to the eyeballs, that's going to that's gonna get rid of a lot of that empathy. Or on the other side of things, if the US does legalize weed and in a weird sort of way I'm, I'm pro the legalization of, of weed in the US but that's going to heighten the empathy and get rid of all of the political will because um, they just sit at home with their thousand dollars worth of UBI just smoking it away and not worrying about getting politically active and at least that'll deal with the anxiety and the heights and the emotion but it'll passive or make passive all of the things that make them politically active so we have to be very careful with this new reality that we're going to create through these yeah and the, whole, Z the whole xanax thing of going i might get a facial tattoo <laughs> it's wow god there's some bad choices made on xanax <laughs> dear me it's not a good drug honestly you can tell me that story later any other questions at all
just at the front here, Ben. Hello there. Hi. Hi. I love your positiveness and, you know, life game changing um, uh, angle on the future and everything. Last time I saw you was at Festival 23, which was. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Life changing event. And I came away with the word pro noia. I think Tim came up with it. But pro noia, it's, it's infectious. And it's really what I think you're talking about, you know, um, and nurturing. Um, um, an overwhelming sense that everyone's conspiring to actually kind of get positive and, and you know help you and stuff, which is um, you know amazing stuff. Um, yeah, shall I define that word for people who might not have heard it? Yeah, yeah. But, um, pro noia is is the opposite of paranoia, right? Uh, pro noia is the sort of creeping suspicion that everybody out there is really trying to help you, <laughs> and. Um, yeah, I think it does. I have heard Tim Leary use use, use the phrase. Um, it's not so much what the book is about, but it's 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 about it's one of those ideas that you realise should have been in our culture, that should have been known. It should be a word we sort of use. You know, we have we have the dark version. Really, we should have the the light version to sort of balance it out, and that would be a much more healthier culture. Having all these things in there, yeah, um, yeah, pro noia. That's all, all for it, man. Question is at the front here. Uh, I just wanted to ask if the future is not this arrowhead linear trajectory, um, why do we insist on talking in Generation X that like some sort of alphabetical progress and, and not enough of intergenerational circulations? Because when we generalize like, oh, in the 80s this happened, it's just a lot of whether you think optimistically and um, or, or negatively, it just depends on your exposure to other groups not just you know your current age group your parents your aunts it's just so yeah there's just not enough of it it's always still talking the same language of oh let, let's talk about who the new generation rather than like what about just the constant intergenerational um conversations that keep happening yeah absolutely you need as many models as you can as you can have i mean i i talk about postmodernism and metamodernism as much broader than just one sort of uh, uh generation but then i also talk about just one generation you use what is useful for for the moment if you use where well, you have a purpose you've got a point you're trying to express you go for the model that's helpful um in a lot of cases especially talking about people raised in the 21st century the difference between millennials and generation z was totally useful it was really helpful for me so i went i went to it quite a lot but you're absolutely spot on it's hardly the only model and the more uh, varied and different and larger and different scaled models uh, that there are you know the the wiser we will be yeah absolutely you shouldn't just rely on one i agree another question just here i think in that vein um, a, a trait since Roman times of the spectator sport of killing and, and the negative side of sport um, pervades to the current day in the, the preponderance of uh, murder uh, theater. Um, it's no longer one death in a, in a whodunit. It's three or four deaths in a whodunit. And the kids are playing with murder games and kill. And is there evidence that we're getting that out of our system, or is is that just something that's hardcore in human nature? It's circumstantial, but I think the answer is yes. I think this generation coming up are more disturbed by casual murder in films and and things like that. They're so they're so much more emotionally invested in fictional characters um, that the idea that you're just you know, gun down a load of people and don't, don't think about it ev anymore is quite horrifying to them. It's, it's quite, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's a very, very noticeable difference. And when you look at, there's a lot of violence in our culture and a lot of violence in our media and a lot of violence in, in Hollywood and things like that. It does tend to be aimed at our, my generation or, or 20th century raised people. If you look at the films that are successful for uh, for 21st century teenagers it's very few you'd, you'd go oh god the violence in that it's they do, do tend to be much more emotionally um here's here's an example uh, remember x factor right the, the the talent show when it started it was cruel 
Uh, the idea was you get some poor kid who's a bit deluded and can't really sing and they're probably a bit overweight and they're dressed terribly and they'd get to go on camera and say, I'm going to be a great star. And everyone would just laugh at them. And like that was, that was the water cooler moment. People go, oh, did you see that person? It was hilarious. They were awful. And people, there was a lot of cruelty in it. If you watch it now, all the cruelty has gone. It's much more uh, about the journey that people are on there. It's much more emotional understanding to them and things like that. Now, that's not because the producers of The X Factor became nicer people. <laughs> it's because the audience that they're trying to reach has changed. So they had to change the program to fit this young audience that they wanted. And I'm definitely not seeing um, casual bloodlust in this generation to the extent that it was before. Sure, there'll be some of it, you know, some teenage boys are teenage boys, don't get me wrong. But I do think there has been a shift away from that, yes. So his Game of Thrones is one of the most popular things. It is amongst my generation, yeah. It's, it's, um, I don't, I'm not aware of any of my teenage children's friends watching it or being in any way interested in it. This, I, I, I'm, I realize I'm just using personal anecdotes here rather than data. I don't really have data about who's watching Game of Thrones. But the, the impression I get is that the audience is older, or my generation anyway, 20, 20 uh, century. Although, as a proviso of that, the way that um, Game of Thrones was not structured on the hero's journey was a much more complicated, interrelated, uh, political um, collision of all these different characters and houses. And, and uh, it, it's, it's a big, big cast. It's complicated. It's a, it's a, a lot like the sort of films like The Wire and, or, or series like The Wire. It's not a hero's journey thing in any way, shape or form. That does seem to appeal um, to this generation who are raised to understand themselves in networks and they're raised not to just think of themselves but to think of how all the different people around them fit in and interact with each other so that does seem contemporary definitely yeah. another question just here hi um, yeah I'm really enjoying your presentation of a more complex kind of picture of the future with more positive um, elements in it. I guess I'm curious within that though. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of instances at the moment of these kind of power grabs by, uh, baby boomer or Gen X kind of power figures, sort of, uh, um, you know, like Bolsonaro or the new incoming kind of government in Australia, this kind of, you know, there's a lot of climate deniers who seem to be having a, a great moment and never mind the far right in this country. I suppose I'm curious whether you're seeing any signs of hope that this generation that you're discussing um, actually has the tools to deal with that because, you know, whether, you know, obviously, uh, you could kind of go, the, this generation, the baby movers are going to die out. The, a lot of the voters voting that way are going to die out. But um, we're kind of against the clock as far as the climate versus when those people, you know, that generational shift will happen by itself. And in the meantime, they're making this massive economic and power grab and sort of entrenching their positions. So, yeah, I'm curious what you think of that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's going to take a lot more than milkshakes to sort of sort this out. Um, for me, I, I, there's a number of things going on here. One, I was talking about metamodernism earlier, and the rise of extremes is a large part of that. So it does sort of fit in with our general sort of sense. But when you see how it all appears to the younger generation, because um, they're not they're not seeing anything that works, right? You know, it's the 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 move to the far right has never been a good idea. There's no point in history, right, where a swing to the far right, you know, has been a good idea and it's worked out great, you know. It's, 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 it's not a proven sort of thing. And they're such a practical generation. They're sort of seeing these old people using these, these ideas that just cause nothing but um, uh, trauma and upset to others and, and things like that. And I'm kind of getting the sense that it's, it's a bit of the last thrash of a dragon's tail that, you know, sometimes a virus has to run its course 
before we can create the antibodies. You know, you just have to let these things go through their, through their uh, cycle until we can sort of get rid of them. Um, just from the sense I'm getting from gener and, and of course, you know, I'm aware that, you know, I live in, in Brighton. It's a very liberal sort of place. We're a wealthy country. We're very sort of liberal. I'm, I'm, I'm only seeing a certain subset of this. But from what I've seen online, and there is this whole red pilling thing of really angry boys being sort of sort of dragged into far right ideas. I am seeing the sense that that it's that it's not that it's emotionally or morally wrong. It's just it doesn't work. Like no good comes of it. It's a crap idea. That seems to be the sense that the, the, the younger getting from it. And as I say, they're sort of sweeping into the electorate and things like that. So I don't know. Hope, hopefully it's the last slash of a dragon's tail. And I cross my fingers that it is. But we will find out, I suppose. Yeah. And the question just... It never really goes away. I think that's the problem. It's always bubbling away. Sorry about that. Hi. Um, thanks so much, John, for that talk. Uh, I had a question. Uh, I was also at Festival 23. Um, but yeah. Excellent. <laughs> About immediacy, you mentioned how it's really valuable to have immediacy with your peers and to create good things. Um, do you think that's something that we need to be thinking about helping Generation Z to have since they're like more isolated in their sort of tech worlds? Or is the tech world a great place for immediacy to occur? I think it's a great place for them just to play. And I, I, get the, I don't get the impression that... Um then uh, they're not that they need encouragement to to be creative and to do things and in many ways they've they've got the the tools that they have access to now they could you could make a film on your iphone and edit it and get it seen around the world via youtube you you know in a way that would be unthinkable for for me growing up uh and and you see in things like meme culture there the manipulation of of, of images and um uh, how that builds on, you know, they'll do a thing, the mate will do a thing, and they'll build on that, and it goes back and forth, and there's a sort of conversation or dialogue going on with these creation of different images in a in, a, in an artistic way. And the amount of kids who are just, you know, getting some a garage band or software like that, and and coming up with albums, and pardon me, I'm just burping slightly. Um, um, they're great, a lot of it. A lot of the stuff they're doing is really good. They have the tools. Uh, they can do it. There's nothing stopping them. Uh, and they're doing it with their mates. And they're, they're just producing all these you know, extraordinary things that um, our generation tends to know very little about. The, the music writer, Alexis Petridis, um, he wrote a thing recently about uh, how he'd seen his daughter's playlist of all the songs, and he just hadn't heard of a damn thing of it. And it's his job to know about these things. And he was terrified. And so he went and looked at all these things. And it would just be a wee girl in a, sitting on a bed with a ukulele doing a thing that, you know, that gets 38 million views because uh, they had their entire culture that they were just creating amongst themselves. And you couldn't monetize it. Uh, it wouldn't work if a major label came down and swooped and, and tuck it up or anything like that. They're just, they're just doing it because they're human and humans do that sort of thing where there isn't a culture that stops them. Um, grow, I grew up in North Wales and there was a, in, you know, in the 70s and the 80s and there's a sort of sense that, you know, if you want to write or, you know, or do something like that, you're probably getting a bit up yourself. You know, it, was, it, it wasn't sort of, that seems to have gone, you know, it just becomes normal to, 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 to make a meme or write a piece of music or do a little animation or, or create a thing or put on a play with your mates and, uh, you know, or get some mad costume, you know, they're, they're interested in drag is really interesting and things like that. Very, very, very creative generation that I can see. So I, I don't think we need to encourage them. I think we just... Well, yeah, well, look after, I think we need to look after them as much as we can and not fuck things up for them anymore if we if we could stop that that would be our most useful sort of thing so at the end of the book john there's a couple of things that you suddenly reveal now usually books about the future the author goes and they meet the experts in in everything that you cover in this book from ai to space to augmented reality to virtual reality 
you didn't leave Brighton. You stayed in Brighton, and there was a very particular reason why you only asked close friends and people who live in Brighton. And if you notice the cover of the book, it's the probably the most Brighton cover for a book about the future. Is everything from the Extinction Rebellion logo to to the little uh, the Pride Heart in the corner there, and a seagull and virtual reality. And so, what was the reason for doing that, and why did that prove your thesis about how we're going to create futures? Uh, oh, I've just totally given away the twist it's a uh, spoiler it's, alert. it's, 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 uh. sli it's slightly set up to, so you don't sort of realize what's going on but the, the image of the future that the book is trying to build and create at the same time I was trying to test I was trying to test all these ideas and see if they were of value if they if they gave me a, a vision of the future that was that was worthwhile and things like that so when I talked a lot about uh, the lack of um, trust uh, in algorithms, the the, the 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 our knowledge of how things like Facebook and things aren't to be trusted and we have to go to those who we do trust. Um, I thought, well, if I just then go off and speak to experts in shiny laboratories and find out that, that that's sort of against the spirit of the thing, that's totally against the spirit of the thing. So I set myself some really strict rules, um, which only revealed at the end. Um, about I could only talk to people within walking distance of my house right? and see if I could come up with a book that was a, a, a viable vision of the future based on, on, the, on these things uh, for, for various reasons. There's a number of other reasons that sort of feed, feed into this. Uh, and it's you know, up to the reader to judge at the end of the book if they think, A, that worked, and if by implication the vision of the future that it's talking about uh, is a workable thing. Something, something like that. So we've just ruined the twist. So, yeah. Spoiler alert. It, it is still worth purchasing the book. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> just, pretend you, uh, just pretend you didn't hear that. There's, there's another conclusion which doesn't really spoil much. Oh, I hope it doesn't spoil much. Which is rather lovely, which is rather Brighton, which is rather John Higgs. Where you turn around and go, look, the key to creating a fulfilling future, and, and this is verbatim, is not being a dick. Could you explain that? It's a very important rule of life. Um, yeah, I do say that in the end of the book, don't I? Yeah. Well, the context was, I can't remember the context of it. It's a good rule, don't get me wrong. You know, this general rule, try not to be a dick, is, is a good thing. I think it's partly because although the coming generations have this greater emotional intelligence they're still the emotions of childhood they're not mature emotions you don't see a lot of forgiveness right very little forgiveness in culture people when people do something wrong right that's it their reputation's gone they're dead to them you know an actor can some some scandal can come up with an actor and they're just apps their career is absolutely over in a way it never was before uh, and obviously we are all a dick sometimes. No, no one's perfect. We're all going to do some daft things, some stupid things. Um, it's best not to try too much of a habit of it, though, in, in the sort of emotional uh, territory that we're, we're uh, entering, I'd say. So on that note, embrace our immediatist, metamodern sitcom. Be part yeah. of that. Books are available for purchase, and I want to thank the Miranda Bar for hosting us this evening and, and for all the volunteers that make Virtual Futures uh, possible. If you like what we do, you can find out about us online at Virtual Futures pretty much anywhere online, and this has been a conversation about the future, and in Virtual Futures tradition, we have to end with a warning, which is this. The future is always virtual, and some things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future isn't predicated on our capacity for prediction, although, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that this evening. Please go to the bar and join me in thanking the incredible John Higgs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's great.